Okay, welcome. Oh, that's kind of loud. Welcome. Uh, my name is Randy Pitcher. I am a uh, data engineer with HashMap, uh, a data consulting company. And uh, today we're going to do some Snowflake training. This training uh, I've done, I want to three or four times for Snowflake at their official events. Uh, they luckily um, keep all these links public. So I thought it would be nice in OKC, it's been about a year since they did an official one here, that, that we could do this. We could do training so that folks looking at 2020 as their year to really get after um, more advanced data warehousing could uh, have this training and start at a running pace, hit the ground running. Um, if you guys have any questions, just jump in. I will repeat those questions to the mic for the recording. Um, and we are recording, so don't like say your social security number or anything, because th they'll get you. OK, so yeah, let's get started. Um, starting out, contents, I want to talk about HashMap. Typically in these meetups, um, HashMap gives me a lot of uh, editorial freedom uh, on what I say, uh, the content I make. And in this one, I thought it would be right to give back a little bit on that. Um, so we, we don't do a lot of advertising during the normal regular meetups. This one's a little special. Um, it's a free training event that is 100% sponsored by HashMap, just me being here, the food, everything. So um, I want to say a few words about what we do because it's really cool. Uh, then we're going to get into the setup for uh, today's content. We'll, we'll go to a link. We'll get the SQL. We'll, we'll make sure everyone has everything they need. Um, and then we'll get directly into the labs, hands-on stuff. Uh, you should leave here with a foundational understanding of what Snowflake is, how to use it, and you should be really confident building your own application. Um, you might not have everything memorized, that's okay. The docs are really, really good, which you can't say about everything, or even most things. Uh, but you should be able to move forward independently after this. And then we'll open it up to questions, but that's kind of a misnomer. Like, we're gonna have questions throughout. This is an interactive session. This is much more like a college lab than it is some kind of lecture. Uh, sound good? Any questions before we get started? Probably not, but it's okay. Okay, and uh, for, for folks that don't uh, have a trial yet, like they're waiting for that email to come in, if it does come in, we can pause, that is okay, because uh, it'll be worth it to, to get on. Okay, cool. So HashMap, the company I work for, um, a lot of people, they ask, you know, what is HashMap? Uh, at conferences, uh, just meeting people on the street. And we have an official like description of what we are, I'll show that, but when I think of HashMap, what I like to tell people is that we're data consulting for rebels. Um, that's not necessarily the enterprise line, but um, we're the place you go when good enough is not good enough. Uh, when you want to do something, when you're ready to add value, when the same old is not going to cut it for this next quarter, um, and you're ready to make a change. That's what that's what we do. Um, the official line, uh, and this is what my sales guy um, would have me say, is that we accelerate innovative business outcomes in data, cloud, IoT, and AI ML with a combination of expertise, best practices, and technology, providing end-to-end -end solution design, development, and deployment. This is not wrong. This is a really accurate description of what we do, but I don't think it gives you that same emotional pull, that gut feel doesn't stick with you. You've forgotten the word. I forgot the words as I read them. So they're accurate, um, but it doesn't capture the whole story. Why go with us over a Booz Allen Hamilton or an Accenture? Um, and it's because we can do things they won't. We can move faster. Anyway, um, we're 180 ish people, that goes up and down depending on the season. Uh, I think Slack has us at about 150. Uh, that's our central kind of messaging tool. 150 customers, that number has definitely gone up, particularly in the last two quarters, uh, across 30 industries. I don't know how useful it is to break industries down exactly by that, but I think the real takeaway is that we are across everything. We have worked in most industries because data is not an industry specific problem. Our, our, I think, biggest vertical, and that's getting less and less true over time, but our biggest vertical is oil and gas. That's where a lot of our experience is. Um, but we have success stories in marketing, insurance, banking, um, lots of really exciting industries. And we produce content. That's what you're, you guys are here for, is the content we're producing. Um, we have a really healthy culture of uh, developer-driven content generation, particularly our blog. Um, if you guys are into Snowflake, you want to hear a little more, you want to get into an advanced topic on your own time, you've got to check out our blog. Um, I just recently published uh, content on timestamps in Snowflake, which are way 
more sticky than they seem, and they seem pretty sticky. So there are some uh, interesting things to learn there. Um, we have people that are doing a lot more advanced stuff, not even just on Snowflake, but like streaming technologies, uh, data science best practices. We do everything from culture to uh, organizational best practices and then technology. Um, we're not afraid of complexity, but we do promote simplicity when you can do it. Uh, we think that's a recipe for winning, especially in the enterprise. And then podcasts. So um, I don't think we've published a new podcast in a while, but we have a good backlog, particularly around IoT stuff. Um, this was, uh, I can't believe I got away with this, but uh, me and the old CTO wanted to maybe have a nice beer. Uh, it's very expensive, so we thought, how hey, we can get HashMap pay for it. Why don't we start a podcast where we drink beer and talk about IoT? Um, and they went for it. So we recorded um, a number of sessions when I was still in Houston. I would love to revive that. We're working on maybe getting more podcast stuff. And to this day at conferences or something, people come up and say, you know, IoT on tap. That was the name of the podcast. Um, they really enjoyed what we did there. And I can't believe anyone wanted to listen to it. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is our content. Definitely worth checking out. I think that sets us apart from a lot of um, folks, particularly of our size. Um, we're based out of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, we have an OKC office. You guys are in the office today. Um, we're upstairs, and uh, Houston's probably our biggest central hub. But we're we're all across the U.S. We have an office in Toronto as well. So uh, we'll we'll meet you where you are. Let, let's get into the setup. So I think that's probably enough of the sales pitch. You guys can talk to me about HashMap anytime. Um, let, let's get into it. So where are we at with accounts? Still nothing. You got one. You got one. Okay, cool. Yeah, they just don't like you for some reason. Okay, and then on this side, did you just give them access to yours? Okay, that's okay. I'm going to be blacklisted. Oh, no. I'm, I'm worried I'm going to get blacklisted um, because I have so many accounts. Okay, but well, um, even if you don't have an account yet, let's open an, yeah. Huh? Oh, no. Check the junk. For sure. Okay, and you have two now. Okay, so good. Um, all you guys will have to do is uh, click on those activation links. You'll sign in, it'll ask you for a new password, use whatever you want, preferably something like LastPass can help you with that, get a, like, a complex 40 character password going on. But if not, that's fine, because these, these are tr trial spaces. Snowflake is incredible about that. They make it really easy for you to get started and build. Some confidence is this will be a valuable expenditure of your time and efforts before you have to actually pay for anything. And when you are ready to pay for something, I, as a human person, not at a company level, I can afford to pay for my own usage because it is so cheap and it's pay as you go. You don't have to sign these massive long-term contracts. So they do have that for the enterprise so that you can, um, you can do the financial maneuvering that works for your company. So I always like to say that because people think for this enterprise kind of stuff like, well, I got to drop 40 grand and sign a contract. Like, no, not at all. Maybe spend 20 bucks a month if that, turn it off. So um, let's, let's open a new tab, everyone. And let's go to this bit link. It is uh, bit.ly slash zero to snowflake 2019 with uh, dashes in between. Uh, this, of course, is still uh, quite fresh for 2020. A lot of the content we're gonna cover here I think will stay fresh really in the long term. We're gonna cover all zones of the Snowflake ecosystem. Um, individual features are added all the time uh, at Snowflake. They have a, a kind of an RSS feed for month to month, what new stuff comes out. I'm always watching that for cool things. Uh, especially as they make an acquisition, you can expect to see some of the acquisition features show up relatively soon afterwards. And then right around their summit, I think is May this year, they're gonna have a flurry of activity. I wouldn't be surprised if they hold, I, I'm, I'm speculating. I wouldn't be surprised if we see just some kind of bug fixes, polishing for the next two months so that they can have a, a massive explosion of, a, uh, of announcements. I know last year they had a ton of stuff I was really excited about. Uh, yeah, so were you able to, to get to this site? It's GitHub, it's my GitHub. You should see code, that's not a mistake. Um, and in the top of that code, you should see another link as well. Uh, you don't have to take my word for it. Let's, um, let's go off road here. Um, right here on line, line five, you can see an S3 link. S3, think of it like Dropbox, it's AWS's file store. Um, and Snowflake maintains a really impressive PDF guide at this location. And it's what we're gonna do today. Um, there's a lot to read, 
So I'm going to try to just express you in human words. Uh, so don't feel like you have to read this line by line, but I know there are some folks who prefer it. Jump back in, in and out, whatever you like. For, for people that like just really like to zoom ahead, go for it. It's fine. You know, you've got these uh, two hours booked to do this, so whatever works for you is fine. Does everyone have access to this SQL code and this PDF? Okay, and then account check. Who's logged in right now? Logged in, logged in. Everyone, okay, cool. So let's go, let's go back to um, GitHub real quick. And you see this raw button? I know it's small up here, but you should see it. If you click on that, you're gonna get what looks like a mistake. But this is really all the SQL that we're gonna use today. It's all prepped, ready for you. This is not gonna replace your like hands-on-ness, so don't worry about that. Um, it really is worth copying all of this. So control A, control C. And then going into Snowflake, um, it may pop up with like a, you know, welcome here. You can tell, go, go away to that. You don't need to do that tour. Um, and then you should have a worksheet. And we're gonna do a tour of the UI real quick, but just go ahead and paste everything in here. I already have it pasted, but, and then scroll back to the top. Luckily, this is commented out such that you can come to the right section in that PDF um, to see where the corresponding SQL is for each. Uh, I wrote a lot of SQL in here um, that does some of the things that you would normally do like in the UI, just clicking around. And we'll come to why that's useful to have both. Uh, so far so good, did we get all the SQL in? Okay. Okay, so we are ready to go. Let's, um, let's go back to that PDF. So what you'll learn today, um, we're gonna create these kind of funny named things in Snowflake. One thing about Snowflake, it's probably good to get comfortable with now. Um, look, naming's hard. I'm not, I'm not gonna diss Snowflake, but they didn't like find a way to name everything perfectly, which maybe you can't do. That's not their fault, but there are naming problems throughout that are gonna be complex. You, you don't necessarily always understand it, but you will get used to it. Um, We'll go from there. We're gonna talk about loading structured and unstructured data. The unstructured thing is so important for uh, what's making Snowflake distinguish itself from its competitors. Uh, one of a few things. Uh, we're gonna clone objects. We're gonna query data using joins. I mean, SQL stuff, right? So uh, who here feels pretty comfortable with SQL? SQL, SQL, that's okay. We're gonna run it. Uh, that's another thing that you just kinda get used to, SQL of all things. Uh, when I'm interviewing people, more than a specific coding language or a specific tech stack, I ask for SQL skills. I don't care what flavor. Because if you know how to think about data structured this way and how to combine it and move it and do stuff with it, that's the core of what we do. Um, we're gonna undo user errors. This is my favorite. Um, anyone who's worked in the Hadoop world, uh, like me, or maybe just in enterprise, might have dropped a table, maybe dropped a whole database, deleted stuff. Um, this has an undo button, and not everything can say that. Uh, we're gonna create roles and users, so we're gonna start talking about the security model of Snowflake, which is gonna be a little different, not entirely different from like your, your Microsoft SQL Server days. Um, it's a little more flexible, which can be scary at first, but I think you'll find that you really prefer it. And when I have to go back to other systems that have less flexibility, I, f I feel gross. <laughs> this is bad. Um, okay, and then um, we're gonna talk about sharing data. This is, I think the major future thing, like what's the killer app on Snowflake? All this other stuff that people are actually buying it for today, um, it's fantastic. It, it solves the problems we have now. It, it's if our BI system worked. Um, this is the future. And, and it's I think where five years from now, we're gonna look back at this as like a, a pioneering event. This is um, microcontrollers in the 70s is what this is to me. So it's a fun time to be, to be here. Uh, okay, so you should all have uh, trials, that's good. Basic knowledge of SQL, that doesn't really matter, I wrote it for you, um, so don't worry. And um, you should know what a CSV and a JSON is. All good on a CSV? It's like, an, it's like an Excel file, right? But instead of like being Excel, it's a text file, if you open it, the comma separated, yeah? Okay, and then a JSON, um, we're good on that? Good, I, I don't have as good a way to explain that one. Oh, great. So step one, we've kind of already done this. Let's move past that. Module two, logging in. So you guys logged in. Um, when I log in, you can, this might be useful. I'm making uh, use of some more enterprise things. So um, my, my password manager is filling in a username and password. This won't work. 
at all. I use a single sign-on. So probably a lot of you here are familiar with single sign-on, probably Active Directory uh, through Azure. Uh, we use G Suite in my company, so when I log in, um, I'm just using my Google account. And I'm authenticated that way. Uh, it also has support for multi-factor authentication, which um, I'm not personally leveraging because we have that through our G Suite, so I feel pretty confident that it's fine. Uh, but you can implement that. You certainly should for higher level accounts. Uh, and this is this is the UI. Let's do maybe a tour here. So when you first log in, two big things to notice at the top is your name, hopefully, or some approximation of uh, an indicator of who you are. And right below that is a role. Many of you should have sysadmin if this is your first time. That's fine. Mine is RTE. Yeah, what's up? Can we do that? There might be movement controls, I just don't know. If... Yeah, let's look. Yeah, it's chopping off just a touch. Yeah, okay, okay, good Good note. Um, we'll look at that later. Yeah, if, if any of this becomes unusable, let me know. The projectors are like, this one's super dim and this one's all askew, so between the two of them, hopefully we can convey. Um, I think, if I zoom in anymore, it breaks and it's no longer useful, so, Definitely look at yours for specifics, but broadly up here. Um, so up here, we, we have, this is what your logged in context is. Context is important in Snowflake. It's who are you and what role are you acting as? Um, a really good thing to do is to not automatically log in as an admin, because if you're like me, you screw up. And it's so much better to screw up not as the admin, because you'll get just a quick permission denied error rather than, yeah, okay, no, it's all gone. Don't worry about it. Um, so. At some point, you would not default in there. Snowflake, when you first fire it up, it's gonna have four default roles. One is public, which is just the nothing role. Um, some people can, you, you can give it permissions. I wouldn't ever, because uh, you want people to be, and there's a like, little isolated island of nothing before you give them permissions. So that's public. Then you have sysadmin and security admin. Sysadmin creates all the objects in Snowflake, your, your storage, your compute, all the like, physical things, it can create it from nothing. That's its special power. Security admin, same thing, but with users and roles. It can create those from nothing. That's a pretty special power. It also can grant permissions on things that security or sysadmin has created. It doesn't need to own the things that it grants permissions to. No other role can do that. It needs to have a special permission grant ability. And then the last one is account admin. This is the super root user. A lot of people get confused what's the difference between sysadmin and account admin. That's the trouble with naming things. Account admin can see some things in your account tab. It can set up really advanced security integrations that you would not want a, just a normal admin to be able to do. It can turn your account off. Again, you don't want just anyone doing that. Um, my rule is never use account admin. It's not a perfect rule, because sometimes you have to, but it's so much better for me to be wrong sometimes than for anyone to think it's okay to use account admin for something they should. So do not ever use account admin. Those are the big three um, when we get started. So the reason I'm going into this so early, because it seems like maybe I'm skipping things, it is always important to know what you're logged in as at the top. And then in your worksheet, you'll notice you also have a context. Uh, this is sysadmin for me, but it could be anything for you. You also see a warehouse, a database, and a schema. Um, so within this worksheet, when we're running queries, if I wanted to jump from role to role, which is common, say I'm creating a new database, I'm gonna need to be sysadmin for that. Create the database, and then immediately I'm gonna want to transition the ownership of that database to some lower privilege role that's like the HR admin that I created. Um, and then I'll jump down to that. It's really common to be bouncing back and forth. Or if you're a data engineer, you create something, you wanna to switch to your consumer's role, the BI role, to make sure that what you created is visible, it's responding correctly, you can pretend to be the person that you're serving. It really helps with debugging. So switching roles is gonna be a common thing in Snowflake. Um, if you switch roles at the top level, it reloads the whole page. It's rather cumbersome, and that's on purpose, right? Because it changes the UI. Some of these fields you aren't gonna be able to see if you're at a lower level role, like billing. Like you don't necessarily want everyone to be able to see billing or usage across different departments. So what they have is this ability to change context here. And you can do that just by hitting change, seeing what all you have access to. And you should see those four if you click on this. I have many more. Uh, but um, I much prefer, and I encourage this to be a best practice for you, use SQL. 
use role sysadmin. Right? That's what I'm, I'm going to write. Um, it's explicit. Uh, the number one problem that people come to reach out to me when Snowflake's not working right is that they think they're a role that they currently are not. I don't know. I don't have permissions to it. Saying access denied, I'm the admin. No, no, you're not. You're logged in as public. Right? Just be explicit with this. Though you can use this UI, some people prefer it. I don't. Uh, Tab by tab, yeah, correct. So um, if I switch to like my miscellaneous, I am the account admin here. And I'm bringing my own rules because I was doing something account admin-y with uh, integrations. So I can go back to my RTE role. And that updates. Uh, don't ever trust this left side. Oh, let's hold that for a second. So these are your different worksheets. You can jump back and forth between contexts. Always make sure you're in the context you think you are, uh, particularly around roles. As long as you're in the right role, most other things will flow from that. Um, and a really important part, you've seen that. I can either use the UI to do something, or I can use normal SQL. And this is one of the most powerful things about Snowflake. Uh, I think everything, but I'm gonna say mostly everything, just to cover myself. Um, everything can be done with raw SQL. Um, and in a lot of cases, if I try to do something, Snowflake will allow me to look at the resulting SQL it will execute. So this UI is really just uh, a convenience feature for generating SQL and submitting it to the Snowflake system. This is really powerful, especially for me as a consultant, because complex flows that I would normally have to have screenshots or like do a video call with for someone, I can just send them a short SQL script. Run all this, tell me what happens. Um, and then for your own internal practice, if you want to automate anything, this becomes so much easier. Where before, like, well, this is a manual step. I can't, I can't automate this. No CI will do this auto, this manual step. So we'll see that throughout. And that's why I bothered to write down from that guide certain things they tell you to do in the in the UI. I've written that as SQL as well, so you can compare back and forth. Okay, let's do the tour. Any questions so far? You'll, you'll spend most of your time here in the worksheets. Uh, they have downsides, so make sure you always name them correctly because there's no good way to search them other than by the name if you close it. You can't share these with anyone. There's no concept of a folder to like organize them. Um, I have a ton. I mean like, a, like a, t a real ton. And most of them, because the default name is worksheet one, worksheet two, I have no idea what's in there. I'm never gonna open that. Yeah. Yeah, so version control. Um, it depends on how you're actually executing against Snowflake. And another cool part about Snowflake is it has such a big ecosystem of abilities to connect. It has its own default command line interface, which is just a tool. And I think they have in help. I can do downloads. Yeah, so here's their CLI. Um, this you just run in like a terminal. Not everyone's cup of tea. Um, it's taking forever to pull up. Uh, I probably added the wrong. Here we go, yeah, so it's, it's pulling up the different things I could use. But I could execute queries here. I can pass in a SQL file to this and tell it to run it, and then the SQL can be committed to Git. Um, when you get more advanced, you'll use different tools. Like I use DBT, which is um, outside the scope of this, but it helps with CICD, uh, and it helps me version control my warehouse, which I think for a lot of people, that's not a concept being used today. They just run the SQL and create it and now we're done. Oh, the data warehouse is done. But that's not that's not reality, right? There's always gonna be changes. Um, and if you don't have a version control, like history of what you've done, when that one expert leaves who did everything, you're gonna be in trouble. And uh, trust me, experts love to leave. That's their favorite thing. Yeah. Yeah, good question. So uh, the question was about the numeracy integration. So, um, the UI is not perfect, uh, so I think almost a year ago, Snowflake acquired a company called Numeracy, which does this kind of worksheet, code editor in the cloud stuff, and it is supposed to be integrated with Snowflake. Oh, I, I would love to see it in 2020. Every time I ask, it's always a couple weeks from coming, right? So I don't know when it'll actually be production ready, but that is gonna allow you to do some amount of, like dashboarding or like uh, previewing results, not just as tabs, but as like charts. Uh, it'll have autocomplete, which would be so nice. Uh, I, I, I don't know for certain, but it would be also cool if you could share these because it is such a pain to have to like copy all this and paste it in Slack to someone. There's not a great way for me to just share my files. Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. Or if you had like a Google Docs style of like multi-contributing, you can like pair code, I don't know, we'll see. 
So yeah, really good questions. Um, they're working on it. There are workarounds, but it'll it'll be probably unproductive to just talk about those now. Okay, good question. Let's do let's do the actual UI tour. So this is the the worksheets where you'll spend most of your time um, running queries. Uh, exploratory analysis lives really comfortably here, um, but then you can also go to your BI tool. Uh, those all connect just fine. You can write programmatic stuff. Uh, so if you're a Python person and you just want to connect with the raw Python stuff, you can do that. Um, they have really good libraries with good support. ODBC, JDBC compliant. So a lot of tools that you might not think are Snowflake ready, they are. It's already there because Snowflake conforms to these standards. Um, on the left, we have our databases. Um, so databases are just a top level folder for storing data. They're not like other concepts of databases. It's not like you can only work within one database and not talk through to another. It's just a folder. So think of it on your desktop. The database is the top level. Within a database, so I'll go in the blog database, which you probably, okay, I didn't give myself permissions on that. Let's go into my snow alert database. This is a monitoring uh, approach I have. And then I can see in my schemas, these are just the second level of folder. That's it, right? And we only have the two. So at your desktop level, at the very top, you have your databases. Within there, you can have some arbitrary number of subfolders. And within that, you have all of your low level objects. That's gonna be your tables, which where data is stored. Views, which is just, um, you guys know what views are? They're, they're like tables, but they, they have data stored in maybe a different way. And it's not actually physically stored. When you query a view, what it's actually gonna do is take the view definition and query the underlying table or tables, and then return that as if it was one table. It's a really fast way to build stuff for simple consumption, but it's not always very performant. So long term, you may not consider that. Um, Okay, so uh, within tables, um, you can see that I have quite a few here. Um, and then you can see some simple metrics about it. How big is it on disk? Um, and uh, how many rows are we storing? So this is a pretty large one. This is my cloud trail logs from AWS. This is everything that happens in AWS lands here. Um, as far as like how Snowflake is thinking about the storage, it is storing your data, depending on which cloud you're using, on the cloud service storage for that provider. That sounds complex. So for AWS, this data is all just stored in S3. Azure, it's going to be in Blob, um, or maybe ADL. I don't know what they do behind the hood, but the way you get it in is through Blob. I'm guessing Blob. And then GCP has their service, uh, GCS, I think, Google Cloud Storage. Um, I mostly work with AWS, so that's, that's the one I'm most familiar with. Uh, but this alone doesn't get you any ability to run a query. It has some metadata that's stored. They're really intelligent about how they store the data in different columnar ways so that it's really fast for OLAP queries, analytic style queries. Um, but that's not how you actually run the compute to get an answer. Uh, for that, you need to go to warehouses. Um, and we're gonna jump over there, but we have some other things here that we're gonna get to. They're a little more advanced. They're not as intuitive as like just raw storage. Um, stages. This is just a pointer to where data is that's not necessarily in a Snowflake table. Um, a good example of this is if I have uh, my AWS logs landing in storage on AWS, I can create a named stage here, which includes credentials for accessing that data. And then when I write SQL to upload the latest data from Snowflake, I just reference the stage as opposed to like having to put in all the really complex connection details. Uh, and maybe you don't even want to expose that to some of your team. You just want them to access this and use it without knowing the secure stuff. File formats, same thing. So if you have a stage, uh, Snowflake supports a large number of different formats for this data. CSV is one we talked about and JSON, but they also support uh, Parquet, ORC, um, XML, uh, and then different levels of compression on top of all of that. So say I have a CSV, but it's not really CSV, it's separated by tab or it's separated by pipe, something rather exotic. I'm doing my own thing. I can define a named file format that knows it's gonna be roughly a CSV, but look for pipes for separators instead of commas. And I also have an escape character because pipes are a valid entry 
value within a column so I can define how to escape that with like a backslash or something. And say every file I have has a header and I want them to know that. I don't want them to ingest the header each time. So all this information you can, you can set up here instead of having to remember it each time and you can reference it when you load data. Use this file format. If I wanted to create one, I could name it up here. Um, schema, again, this is just a folder I'm gonna put it in within this database. It could be anywhere. Um, and, and there's lots of different configurations. But this show SQL button, okay, shows me what SQL is actually gonna be ran to execute this. The real value is, say I don't wanna look up in the docs how this is done, I feel comfortable entering it in the UI, but I want it saved in version control so I can see what specific uh, configs I use. I can copy this, paste it in a worksheet, and then run it there. And then I don't have to be reliant on using the UI each time. It's a great tool for learning. When I first got it started, I, anyone here use uh, VBA, get started with that, or record macros in Excel? That's the easiest way to get started, and then eventually you tweak it and tweak it. Um, that's maybe a, too much of a niche experience, but that's how I got started. You can share them. So the question is, are, are the file formats warehouse or database specific? Um, so the file format must live within a schema. They can't, I, I think, live at a top level. I'm almost certain of that. So it has to be in one of those folders. But as long as you have access to use it from like another database, uh, you can use it. So a really common pattern is to have a utilities database. And you may have one already. I don't, that might be default within which you store not just file formats, but also user-defined functions, stored procedures, their named entities that exist there. Um, and then that can be used across the warehouse. Yeah, that's a good question. And then sequences, that's kind of an advanced SQL thing. Um, say you, you need uh, an increasing by one ID for a table every time you call a function. Um, sequences are really good for that, or if you're gonna jump up by six every time for a specific computation. This is good, um, but not something we wanna get hung up on. So let's move on to warehouses. I know I'm skipping two here, but this is the next logical unit. But databases, this whole section, this is how things are stored and exist over time, how they persist in Snowflake. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, let's go to the fun part. I think so far databases, this is not a drastically different concept from existing solutions. When you see this, it, it's not like, you have to get, wrap your brain around it. That makes sense, they're folders, you put stuff in folders and fine. Warehouses are different. So warehouses, unfortunately named, probably my biggest gripe on a thing that's been named, um, you'll often hear them referred to as virtual warehouses. They don't refer to individual units of like data and queryability, like Snowflake itself being a warehouse, right? Um, or your on-prem warehouse. It's When you say that, you're talking about the ability to compute and the storage, it's all in one, it's one thing. You query the warehouse, you store data in the warehouse. Here, these virtual warehouses are not that. No data is stored here. These are sized units of, com of compute. So clusters that will, when run, query the data in those databases on those storage, they're totally separated. It'll load it, run the compute, return the results. There's a lot of power to this, a lot of value, but it's not immediately intuitive. So my favorite example is, have you guys ever had a warehouse that runs slow because some production job is running? Um, or maybe some data scientist executed a really complex query and it brought the whole cluster down. Your production flows just broke. I've done that. Um, you don't have to worry about that here because the production stuff has its own dedicated uh, compute that cannot be interfered with by your experimental compute or your BI compute. They're, they're separate tracks. That also means you can right size them for what you're doing. Say my major ingestion and ETL jobs need to have a rather large compute. Um, they need to have eight clusters. I can spin up a large, I think is eight. Um, they, they increase by a factor of two each time. So extra small is one, small is two, medium is four. Yeah, large is eight. And they go up to four XL, which I think is 128 or 256 uh, nodes. So they can get rather large. Um, you can have the large, expensive, high performance uh, compute dedicated for your production stuff, but then you can have your BI be something smaller. And maybe it doesn't stay on all day, it turns itself on on demand. But then you have your dedicated like executive C-level, I don't care, any time of day, middle of the night, it needs to be on and fast and responsive. 
you can have that, though that might not be appropriate for your entire load. So you can start thinking about your workflows in different ways. It's going to save you money and increase your performance. And a lot of things can say they do both. Um, but an anti-pattern would be like the small warehouse as a name. Don't ever do that because what if it gets turned into an extra large? They scale up and down. They're, they're fungible, right? They don't exist um, as pets that you keep and feed and know for long term. Like if you've maybe like named your server and you love it and it's on prem. No, these are cattle, which sounds uh, it sounds brutal, but that's kind of the the invention, the, the convention. Um, you don't really care which specific cow it is. Just you need four cows. They run and then off they go. They go back. So here I have um, some good example of naming. Uh, you guys probably have Compute Warehouse. Um, that's usually default, and it's large, which it sh I don't think it should be necessarily for default stuff, but that's okay. Uh, but I have like my Sigma Cloud Cost Monitoring Reporting Warehouse. That's a pretty long name. Sigma is my BI tool. Cloud Cost Monitoring is the specific task I am doing with this tool. So that way my Cloud Cost Monitoring reports don't interfere with my other Sigma reports. And then I have a Reporting Warehouse Convention. Um, this just lets me know that this is for BI and I can use other analytics to like aggregate all of my reporting warehouses to see the total spend of my reports. Um, it is a bit of an art. There's different subjective ways to do this. I have my way, but use what works with your team. Definitely don't just call it the extra small warehouse or worse, something like the Databricks warehouse. Well, that's rough because you're going to have production flows there and you're going to have interactive stuff. And either you're going to under-resource for your production stuff and things will break or you'll over-resource to make sure production runs, but now all your dev stuff is really expensive. It's just way over provisioned. So these are warehouses. Um, if I wanted to create one, we, we could create one right here. Um, extra large, again, 16 credits. Let's talk about credits. Um, so Snowflake charges in two major ways. One is for storage, which is like $23 a terabyte a month. It's um, really cheap. I mean, it's so cheap that you almost can ignore it at first because your cost to optimize for storage before other things is it's just not, oh great, you save 20 cents a month. Like no one, can, no one cares. That's not worth it. What you do care about though is the compute. So compute is charged by credit. Uh, Snowflake has a, a pretty actually um, understandable charging scheme compared to a lot of services like this. Um, if you want if you run one node for one hour, that's one credit. So an extra small warehouse has one node. If I run it for 30 minutes, how many credits have I spent? Anyone? I know I said a lot. Half a credit. Yes, I've spent half a credit. Um, it is just that, that simple. Um, so if I run my small warehouse has two nodes, and I run that for an hour, how many credits? I won't ask any more math, I promise. It, two, thank you, thank you. Uh, two credits. So uh, really simple to understand, like when I see extra large 16 credits an hour, how many nodes are backing this cluster? 16, thank you, yeah, okay. It is that simple. Yeah, okay, so uh, here are the different ones. 128, not 256, uh, is the max, and then down to one, they double each time. Um, maximum clusters and minimum clusters, this is a scaling feature. So say I have a small warehouse, uh, but I'm going to have live load on it. And I don't know at what time my usage will peak, and it definitely can't slow down. It's servicing maybe 200 BI users. Um, what I could do is have this cluster max be up to 10, and Snowflake will automatically add behind the scenes here another of the same warehouse size another small or another extra small, whatever this is, and that'll scale up with load to service concurrent queries. You don't do this for complex queries that are taking too long. You do this for when you have way too many queries of a smaller nature, and this allows you to scale up, and then it'll scale back down as load decreases. This is an auto-scaling feature. It's great for production, um, and you have different policies. Auto-suspend, that's how long it'll stay on before it turns off. Um, minimum here is five minutes. You can actually go down to a minute with SQL. I'll show you how. Uh, that's usually pretty good. Extra small, I almost always start with that because it's surprisingly powerful. It's until you get to full production level workloads, you're probably fine with extra small. That's really cheap. Um, Snowflake bills by the second, but every time you turn a warehouse on, you will pay for 60 seconds minimum. 
Um, that's as complex as it gets. So 1 60th of a credit every time you pop it open. Credits, um, sticker price, I think for enterprise is $3 a credit. Um, I think that's five cents-ish as the minimum billing every time you turn it on. But uh, you can get better deals or whatever you buy like in bulk, like everything else. Yeah? Yeah, so this clustering, um, if you're on the basic plan, multi-clustering isn't a feature you can use, that's fine. You just upgrade. Yeah, good question. The question is about which tiers have this. I typically don't worry too much about tiers. The differences are pretty small, but that's why you would want to go with an enterprise plan because it has better support and it has a few more of these features. Their lower plans, it's just cheaper per credit. Instead of $3, you pay $2. You just don't get as much. Okay, uh, auto suspend, you always wanna set that rather low unless you, you have like that CEO example where it needs to be on all the time, ready to go. Because the cold start when you hit one that's not on yet, um, it's not massive, but it can be, it's noticeable. Especially if you have a large, large cluster. If you have a 128, um, that can take a little while to provision. And then comment, that's always good. So show SQL. This is the SQL we would use to create the warehouse. Um, and you'll see that we have this exact kind of SQL in, in our code. So these are warehouses. They'll make more sense once you start using them. Um, but are there any questions? Okay. Okay, so these are the two major parts I wanted to show you. Um, shares, this is that sharing. Uh, Snowflake has the ability to grant access to your live data in really fine-grained security controlled ways so you don't expose something you don't want to, to other Snowflake users. Uh, a good example of this, I, I saw someone who sells housing data and I mean, it could be many, many gigabytes. And they spend a lot of money trying to distribute this data to their clients. And then their clients will load it and it's static, right? They get it weekly, right? Or maybe daily. Um, and they zip it and it's like either email based or a link and it's just a lot of manual work where if you subscribe and through the Snowflake plan, they just turn on the sharing for you. And it's live data anytime I update it and maintaining here, the person consuming it gets the live data. There's no copy and you don't get charged anything extra because it's already stored. They don't duplicate the data at all. They're just pointing access in the cloud to this new storage. And then all the consumption happens by that shared person. They pay for their compute, which is the expensive part. Yeah. And then they have other things in between, right? Uh, where if you want to share but still pay for that consumption, you can do a reader account. Um, and that's a little advanced. We won't do that today. But I don't have any shares set up. Uh, interestingly, though, the way Snowflake um, exposes your usage back to you is as a share. So if you see the Snowflake database uh, in your worksheets, you'll notice it has a little icon change. And that means Snowflake is sharing its internal databases back to you. Uh, so you guys are already using sharing without realizing it. Data exchange um, is a very new feature. Um, I haven't gotten to play with too much, but once you have shares, then it's reasonable to think that there should be a marketplace for finding interesting data that you would wanna share or paying for data. And if you're a data producer, maybe you want to have an app store style entry where people can just really seamlessly through their account, subscribe to your service and pay you through there. Um, and this is what I'm talking about with the future of data. Um, people talk about freeing data, democratizing data, but really they just mean centralizing it in their own company. Uh, but this could be something huge. That's worth checking out, but not in the scope for today. And then history, that's one of my favorite tabs. Um, if you've ran any queries, probably not yet, but you can see the really deep down details here and you can filter through them for what ran. So this use role you guys saw me run, I can look at the query ID, which is a link you can share internally. You just send, hey, look at this weird query. Here's the SQL, here's everything I know about who ran it, it was successful. Um, and the profile, uh, which is really interesting, we'll get into a little later, shows you uh, what portion of the compute time to execute a query was spent in which step. And it's really valuable for finding bottlenecks in your system. So there've been times when I thought, oh, I gotta rewrite the query, it's too slow. And I go and look and 90% of the time was just loading the data from the underlying source. It wasn't actually spent in the compute time. So if I would've spent half a day trying to get it faster, the fastest I could get is maybe 5% if I doubled my efficiency. Uh, whereas if I look here first, okay, it's giving me an internal error, I think because this command doesn't actually use a query plan, it's just a metadata command. Uh, we'll look at those. But if I see that it's a storage thing, I can maybe change the way I store the data. Or I can do that compute one time long and then store the results because it's worth it 
the next time for it to just query directly to the results. So this helps direct um, your efforts and you don't waste time. And I spent a ton of time just twiddling around like in the Hive or Hadoop days trying to change something that wasn't actually the bottleneck because metrics are really hard. And this just gives it to you for free. And the account tab, you guys should be able to see this. If you don't see an account tab, um, you can jump up here and switch role to account admin. And you should see, you should see the account admin uh, or the account tab pop up. And you can see usage uh, costs. I've got a lot more usage here. Um, and you can also see for your storage. So I have a total of 17 warehouses burning 112 uh, credits this month. That's a little over $300, like 350. No, no, like 336. Uh, and I can see specifically what days I'm burning a ton. So on the 14th, I must have done a lot. I know exactly what this is. That's why our credits are so high. But this is built in. Um, the analytics don't always give you the finest grain that you want. Like none of this can tell me who did this. Uh, and there are good reasons for that. So that's why naming your warehouses really well is going to come back to pay dividends because I can tell this RTE warehouse is me. Um, cloud cost monitoring dev warehouse, that's a really specific thing in my context. I know what that means. And I know probably who it is. Where if I just had the Databricks warehouse and it was really high one day, now I'm gonna do an investigation. I gotta run queries, I gotta to talk to people. That can be a pain. All of these, these visualizations right here is built on top of the data that's already available to you through that snowflake share, right? So yeah. you can wire that up to your own Amazon platform to build your own custom visualization. Yeah, so the question was, you know, is the underlying data here that they use for visualization, is that available for other uses? And the answer is yes. Um, they expose that data back to you that they're actually using for billing purposes in the, the account usage area. Um, and I actively have uh, Sigma dashboards that pull off of that, and I have reports that send weekly to my Snowflake channel in Slack, letting people what we, know what we used. I actually found that just by turning that on, no other work, I was able to drop our spend by 80%, because people just didn't realize how much spend was. And when they see a big number, the first thing they think is, is that me, did I leave something on? Um, and just weekly is all it took. It was a really big win because it once you have it set up, I can redeploy it anywhere because everyone else has the same data uh, and they can benefit from that. I also have it listed publicly as well. I have a bit.ly link for that. We might check that out later because um, it's really nice in front of a client to be like, yeah, this is our spend. This is the kind of you know analytics we can help provide. And you wouldn't know to do that unless you've um, you've been burned by bad snowflake practices in the past. Um, also within here, we have users. So this is all all the users we have, we can create them. This is good for getting the syntax. Uh, right for the username, some more advanced stuff, and then I can always show the SQL. Yeah. Just right there. Um, we have our roles, uh, and this we're going to talk about. Users are actual entities in Snowflake, but you never grant them any access. You can't like grant a user access. What you can do is give them access to a role, and the roles hold access to using a database, read um, level access, or uh, using a warehouse or controlling a warehouse. They're all conform. They're, they're all done through this role structure. It's called role-based access control. Um, it can get messy if, if you just have like the one role everyone shares because. What you'll do is over provision it, and now everyone's an admin. And it can also get to be an overwhelming complexity if you fine grain down to the row level, table level, every little thing anyone can do, and each person has their own little uh, boutique role. It's too much to maintain. So there's middle grounds to strike. That's part of using it and building expertise. It's what us at HashMap offer. Um, it's just an accelerator for how to do this in a way that's sustainable and secure for your, for your organizations. Um, policies, this is kind of around network policies, who can actually access this. So I could um, block IP addresses I know to be bad. Uh, a fun one is just block everything from Tor uh, endpoints. Uh, if you don't expect that anyone from your company will legitimately use a Tor endpoint to connect. Um, and then allowed IPs, that's trickier. If you're at your house, don't do this because you, you don't have a static IP, whether you think you do or not, and you get locked out. Um, and it, brings more to the point. You probably want to have at least one other person have account admin access. Um, in the grim scenario, like you're using this enterprise and you get hit with a bus, things happen. Or better scenario, you're camping and you get lost, you have a great adventure. Um, if they need something, no one else can get access to that. And it can take a couple business days for Snowflake to like override that and confirm everything. So you always want to make sure, we joke like if both your admins are 
flying somewhere, make sure they're, they're on different planes. It's dark, I know. Uh, but I think the lesson holds. <clears throat> sessions are individual connections that you can explore. So I have multiple sessions open. Um, some of them are through like the CLI or through a Power BI connection or through this UI. So you can see individual ones. And if there's a weird one um, that's like this key pair for snow alert, that's maybe that's weird to me and I can investigate it. Resource monitors, this is something that is super useful. These are budgets. Um, and we should probably create one right now. Um, so if you guys, let's do something here. Let's create a resource monitor. We'll call it um, monthly budget, credit quota. Um, you guys have 200 credits that you started out with, but maybe you wanna make sure you don't blow through all of that today, leave something on an accident. So what do you think, 50, 100, whatever you think. And then the level. So I can either, because these are credits, right? I can either pick specific warehouses that I have named and put a budget just for them, like the, the accounting department, if they go past 70, they're on their own, right? Um, or for the whole account. So for my entire account, I never want spend to go beyond this. Um, that way you don't ever get surprise bills. It'll turn it off. So I'm gonna get an error because I already have one. So I'm gonna jump into editing the one I have. But you can see from there, um, the schedule, I have it beginning at monthly, so that's following my billing cycle, but you could do something different if you wanted to. Maybe I have like weekly, um, what do you have? Weekly or daily budgets, if you're more granular. And then we have different abilities here. I can suspend, like just, um, suspend will accept no new jobs, but it will continue running existing jobs when you hit the threshold. And then notify is gonna send out in your notification preferences. It'll send out emails to everyone subscribed to this. Uh, suspend immediately, it doesn't care if something's running, it just shuts it all down. And that'll also notify, but then you can just do different notifications. So I'll do like 20, 40, 60 type stuff. I don't mind the emails, it doesn't happen much. But it's nice to have an early warning. Um, those have become yet less useful as we've gotten more uh, advanced in our dashboarding of usage because I can use the actual dashboard to identify uh, swings, peaks, and I can act on them before I have to get notified by an email. So uh, put in the values you want and then go ahead and click create. We can see the, again, the SQL here. It's one of my favorite parts. Uh, so if I'm with a new client and I'm setting them up, I can just run this query. And if they don't want to know about it, it's just done. Uh, and click create. Does that work for everyone? You should see it pop up here. Um, you can edit it. I can see right now I'm at about 25% of my um, 400 credit budget. Uh, that 400 credit budget is below what our peak was, but we haven't hit 400 in months. You know, maybe since November? Oh, before that, October. And then I have specific ones here. So a Sigma database or a Sigma budget um, this hits my publicly accessible dashboards because I do have them on the public internet and I don't want them to use more than 20 credits. I do demos, so it's not nothing, but if someone, for example, just like hammered publicly, they really want to drive our bud, like our spend for whatever reason, they uh, hate how cool HashMap is, maybe a competitor, um, they couldn't spend more than 60 bucks. No. And then training, of course, I give them 150. Because uh, training, I have kind of a unique user base uh, because they're all um, at some point going to need admin access because they're training to become Snowflake experts. They need that access. Uh, but most of them, if they're on here, it's because they're not on an assignment because they haven't really reached that threshold. They haven't started shadowing. They haven't had formal training. So they're almost certainly novices. So I have a huge fleet of novice admins. <laughs> Uh, in my environment. So monitoring is incredibly important. Reacting fast is important. Um, and then having good budgets helps a lot too. And then reader accounts. We talked about those. We're not going to do much with this today. But if I wanted to expose in a really secure, totally different URL place, um, compute and storage in my environment, maybe I have a vendor partner who doesn't use Snowflake, uh, but I want to expose this data to them in a shared way. They can log in here. They can manage the space as much as they want. You give them a budget for how much you'll spend for their compute uh, and they can use it. And you can build that back to them really conveniently too. Um, but ideally, you know, they would have, they would have a stuff like account too and you could just use shares. Um, any questions on the UI? 
Um, up here we have Partner Connect. That's really fun to mess with because there's a there's a whole ecosystem here. Snowflake's just doing the the warehouse side, and they stick to what they know. They do it very well. But that uh, you know warehouse alone doesn't give you a production data practice. You need things kind of on the left, like Fivetran, which will ingest data, is a, a extract and load as a service. I love Fivetran. You should really check that out. Stitch is similar. Um, and then you have things on the right, and that would be like Tableau, Power BI, or in my case, Sigma. Um, and here you can have a one click, it'll create an already connected to your Snowflake account, like Fivetran instance, and it'll email to your existing email and you'll have a login and you're good to go. It's, it's like a easy button for going through the sign up page on the specific site. Cause these are all like software as a service offerings. Um, instead of going there, signing up and then following the complex instructions to connect it to your Snowflake warehouse, it's just automatically connected. These are worth checking out. And they have great free trials. Sigma and Fivetran especially, I recommend. Stitch is also fun if you're just getting started. And then help. Um, documentation is fantastic. You'll, you'll want to live here. Maybe you have this bookmarked at some point. And then a lot of the downloads are here if you need an ODBC driver. Uh, you can get these as well just by Googling. Things are well indexed, but I come here a lot. Go, Python, anything like that. Um, these ODBC drivers, you'll need that for certain connections to work, like Power BI, you'll need one of these installed on your Windows machine. But you guys can figure that out, mostly on your own. And for now, let's go back to worksheets. And let's actually run some code. Now, I hope it's okay that we, we are off this PDF guide. The PDF guide is great. Um, if you're just on your own and you're walking through it, I think it's probably a little better in these scenarios because we have limited time to, to be a little more adaptive and stay in the UI. Uh, but if you, if you are wondering what's in there, they have a ton of great content, and explainers, links. Uh, definitely check that out, maybe a little on your own. I don't like to follow it too closely. So first, um, let's do module three. I've already logged in and toured the UI. preparing to load data. So uh, if you don't have any data in Snowflake, it doesn't matter how cool it is because you can't do anything fun with it. So let's start by using the sysadmin role. You'll see in the, um, the PDF that they mostly use the account admin role and I get why they do that. It's simpler for new users, uh, but it's a bad practice. So I like to break that habit early on. Use sysadmin for where that needs to happen and security admin for where that needs to happen. We're all pretty intelligent adults. We can handle that. And let's create a database called City Bike. So I'm gonna see a ton of stuff on the left side that you guys won't see because I have a ton of databases. And when I create the database, you may notice it doesn't automatically pop up. This little refresh button up top is gonna be your best friend. Always run that before asking IT or asking for help um, because it doesn't auto refresh all the time. So uh, I click that button nonstop. Uh, so if you create, you run these two commands, uh, maybe I glossed over that a little bit. A couple ways to run a command. You can, don't run all queries, because some of these are going to break on purpose, that's part of the lab. Uh, but you could, if you wanted to run all of it, just click run all queries and run. If I have my cursor, not nothing highlighted, if I have my cursor in a specific line and I click run, it will run that command. If I highlight a command and click run, It'll run that as well, just fine. If I highlight just a portion of it, which is really common, say I forget the U, or that won't work, just roll here and run that. It's only running the specific stuff I highlighted, so it's gonna throw a fit. The highlighting is really nice if you have like a nested query and you wanna see what your inner query is gonna return, just highlight that part, that's really convenient. Um, and then you can run two, two in a row. So highlight two. Now I'm gonna get an error because it already exists, but if I did create database, if not exists, there's different syntaxes, right? Then I can run both of these, totally fine. That's the basic. Now for the for what I do, um, there are shortcuts. So if I have my cursor here uh, on a Mac, if you hold command and hit enter or return, it'll run. And I believe in Windows, it's control enter. Uh, that's what I like a lot. That way I keep my hands on the keyboard. All good on how to run things? 
It'll pop up if you try to run multiple lines the first time and it'll say, are you sure? I, I just, don't tell me about that again. And then you can run multiple lines in peace. Okay, everyone created a database. We got City Bike. So this is a really cool data set. The data is shared to us um, through Snowflake. They have a public, I think, S3 bucket that we're going to access. Um, and when you get data in, you need to first create these folder structures to hold the data. And then we'll create some way to access it, and then we'll actually ingest it. And City Bike, anyone familiar with that? It's, um, it's like a bike sharing service. Uh, I think they had City Bike at Purdue when I went there. Um, so you can rent a bike, and this would be data around different trips. When did someone get it? What was the time of day, uh, how long did they have it on average, I think maybe even costs. Uh, so it's a great data set of real world data um, to play around with. So the next, let's set our context. Um, I can use database, city bike, and then use schema public. When you create a database, you get two schemas out of the box, public, which I don't recommend using, but they're great for demos, because uh, public has some implied privilege and uh, you don't want permissions to just like happen. You want to do them on purpose. And then there's the information schema. So a lot of the metadata about a uh, database, including the tables in it, their names, their sizes, lots of really good stuff, that's going to exist in the information schema. All the different columns across everything. You can do a lot of really cool stuff here. Load history is particularly nice. Uh, if you have some automatic loads and you want to see, oh, something broke, what happened? You can come in here and query it, or even have a dashboard hit it. Okay. Now, the other way to do this, if I wanted to like do the equivalent of use database, is come up here, hover over the database, and then click the one I want. Um, though I am a fan of using the SQL syntax. So at this point, my uh, context is set. I have used these databases. Now, if you're using a database and using a schema, you do not need to use the fully qualified name for something. I could just call this trips. And then Snowflake will know, okay, you're using city bike in public, so we're gonna create the citybike.public.trips. Um, this is another area where I see people make mistakes because they think they're in one schema that they're not. Um, so I, because I'm very <laughs> pedantic, I always specify the fully qualified name. I think that's a good practice, but you don't have to. I don't want to be accused of being a nerd or something. <laughs> Use full qual fully qualified names all the time. So let's, let's create or replace a table. Create or replace is really interesting because if it already exists, rather than if not exists, just not throwing an error and doing nothing, replace will just delete it and replace it again. So uh, trips, this is going to be um, the different columns we're going to get from this city bike data. Uh, we have the duration, start time, stop time, lots of really good stuff. Um, and then even some user information. So this is going to be a somewhat not fully normalized data set, and that's common in Snowflake. Uh, normalized being like a, a formal way of storing data in databases that doesn't duplicate stuff um, and keeps them in their own tables. You have to do a join. In analytics workflows, you often want to have denormalized to avoid joins, but still have really good, fast um, uh, analytics queries. So let's run this. I'll, I'll do my quick run. And trips should be successfully created. So if we refresh over here, and then we, we go into the public schema, we should see trips. You can click on it, and it'll give you a little information, um, number of rows and the storage, and uh, the columns and column types. And now, let's create the state. So we have a table, it's empty. It's ready to accept data. We have um, a database and a schema that, that exists in, and now we need to point to the data. Uh, we could just reference this URL S3 complexity, which is pretty simple here, but they get nasty um, each time by building it raw when you do a copy into command, which is how you're gonna get the data in. Um, or you can create these stages. These stages are best practice. Typically a stage, like it's created and like its URL doesn't change over time. It's pretty static. Just data gets ingested at different frequencies and you can pull from there. So let's create this stage. Again, we're gonna go in the city bike public space. And the URL is really the only parameter it needs because this S3 location, um, Snowflake does not secure. They keep it open on purpose so people can do this. But if it were your internal S3, you may have references to authentication information right here to make sure only you can get it. And now we're going to run a, a, a list command. List, um, this is a pretty common command in like Linux. We just want to see what files exist on the stage. This at syntax 
is just marking this object as a, a stage object, a named stage. And this is a really good one to run without actually, like we didn't ingest any data, we haven't done any damage anywhere. Um, we're just checking the connection. And you should be able to see the fully qualified name. So this is the full path. Um, and you'll notice there are multiple files. That's a cool thing about stages is that you can access lots of files in one space, as opposed to like trying to have some scheme with just this is the one master data file and we update it or we do something else. Um, we can see the size, a hash of it, and when it was last modified. This is all really useful information, the hash especially. That way you can um, combine that with uh, the name and you can make sure that you don't re-ingest data when you don't mean to. So if you run a copy command two times, uh, it'll only grab data you haven't looked at yet. So that's nice. Is this working for everyone? Can you guys see all this? 376 rows, it's gonna be 376 uh, files. So let's create a file format. So we talked about this earlier. Um, there are some peculiarities to almost any kind of CSV, like CSV can mean a lot of things to different people. So I've written down here, which normally you do in the UI, you go into the database, you click the database you're in, you click the schema, you go to file format, you hit create file format. Let's not do that. You guys can always do that. That that's, makes sense, it's just exploring around. Let's use the SQL, because I actually think it's simpler. Um, we're gonna create a file format called CSV within our city bike public, and we're just gonna say, this is the only CSV type we care about in this context. Uh, the type uh, is, of course, CSV. That brings in certain defaults from Snowflake. Um, field optionally enclosed by, this is like a, a Unicode character that will potentially enclose a field that has within it other commas. So it knows, okay, this is enclosed. That doesn't actually mean a new column. That's just part of it. Uh, a good uh, use case of that is like Amazon comments will for sure have comm uh, commas within them. And that might be a, a, a column within like your Amazon product review table. So you'll see that null if, um, this is gonna actually replace true null. Anytime it sees a string called null or lowercase null or just an empty string, um, this prevents errors where if something's not there that it expects, yeah. So I think in this context, it applies to the whole file. So you can have like data type specific stuff by not having it strings here. So by the nature here, it has to be able to compare equally. So say, yeah, say like zero, you just add zero, right? So if it sees a zero, just replace that with null. Maybe that's appropriate or not. Um, outside of that, once it's been ingested, your raw table, your logic for what actually constitutes null that's at a column level is your next transformation. Yeah, so good question. Uh, this is largely just to make sure it ingests properly because when I first ran it, it didn't without this information. And I'm saying, okay, so if uh, a particular row doesn't have the right number of columns, should I throw an error? And I'm saying no, because I happen to know has instances where that's not right, and it'll just fill in with null. But if you want to be really strict and you consider this to be a data quality issue worth notifying about, worth breaking things, you can set that to true. So let's run this. This, um, this will create the stage. And now, um, somewhat anticlimactically, we are ready to ingest data, but we haven't yet. Let's move to module four and do that. So when you're ingesting data this way, we, ha we have our, our stored data in uh, S3, totally different cloud. And we have directions, a roadmap in the city bike public CSV to how to get there, what is there, how do you access it. Um, and then we have internally a place to put it. But you need, you need a motor to drive this effort. This takes compute. So now we're going to actually create a warehouse. So line 59. Um, again, like a lot of things, you could go into the warehouse area and create it. Um, here, I, I would like to just create it right here. So the syntax is the create warehouse, warehouse name. These don't live in databases. You'll notice that I don't do the fully qualified name because they're top level. There is no folder construct. The only way to differentiate hierarchies of warehouses is with a naming convention. And that's why you see I have such long names. If I had a folder of some kind uh, to be able to store my warehouses, and I'm not suggesting they do this, but, but I would certainly use it and have shorter names. Um, the warehouse size is small, um, two nodes. So it's gonna burn two credits an hour. And the auto suspend is 60 seconds. Um, 
we can set that lower, have it turn off every 30 seconds, but it won't save us any money because the minimum is 60. So all you'll do is hurt yourself. You'll turn it off, but you're still being paid for it being on. You might as well keep it at 60. Um, if you set it at 90, right, you're gonna get billed for 90 seconds of usage each time because it won't turn itself off. Uh, there are reasons why you wanna keep it on. Uh, so turning it off, of course, saves money, but it also means you'll have more cold starts when people hit it, uh, and you'll have more time spent refreshing data because if you keep it on it'll remember the last kind of raw data it saw it'll cache that and it can be hotter kind of storage uh, and if you have really steady load over a day then you can actually see improvements in performance for similar costs just by leaving it on okay um, and when you create it it should automatically have um, been assigned to you up in the top you can see in the context and it maybe has a green light uh, the default when you create a warehouse is to have it on, but you can have it when you create, like initially be suspended. There's lots of fields here you can look into for what your use case is. And let's set our context. I like to highlight all of this. So just like the four up here, we have our um, role, warehouse, database, and schema. I'm gonna run that here. Now we've already got some of this set as like the database and schema. Uh, again, I, I recommend being redundant every time you have any sort of breaks here, because in the future, someone might add a little code in between these two parts to do some other thing that uses a different role. And if you assume that you're gonna be in the role you want to uh, be in, you might have a mistake. Always good to be explicit. And we're gonna finally copy. Let's break this down. Copy into, we are telling it we wanna copy data from a place into a target. The target is this trips table that we've already created from lets us reference lots of stuff. I could reference another table, right? I could um, reference some just arbitrary function that doesn't use anything. It could just be a select statement. But here, I'm gonna bring it in from this stage we created. Remember the at symbol is that. File format, because I could use anything, right? I, I could let it do a fault, I could do anything. I'm gonna use that reference file format that we just made. And if I have an error, just for today, because we're doing, um, doing a demo, we're gonna continue. We're not gonna throw a fit about it. And occasionally that is appropriate for production stuff. You just know the data is gonna be crap sometimes, and that's okay. But other times, if, if it is bad, that's a notification event. Someone needs to know. So let's run this. So we are using a small warehouse. Why would we use that instead of an extra small? Um, for certain workloads, your price won't change by using something bigger because the pricing scales linearly. For two nodes, you spend twice as much. So if it takes half the time, you spent the same amount of money, All right? Not everything will scale that way. You can't just throw another 20 and have it run 1 20th the time. Uh, but some things do, and loads typically do, as long as your files are of the right size, and th that's a little more advanced topic. But if they're within a certain window, um, each warehouse that turns on, uh, a node, each node will grab a specific file, process it, and move on to the next one. And they'll all just churn through that. So that's one of my kind of favorite parts about Snowflake. I have a lot of favorite parts, is that if you know what you're doing, you can move faster and not have to spend any more money. So uh, if we looked at the results here, it should give us like a list of loadeds. The status is loaded, hopefully no errors. We can scroll through that. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Uh, and these are the individual files we looked at from earlier, the 376 that we listed. And now this will be persisted in that information schema load area. So if I wanted to have a monitoring dashboard based on errors on load, it's simple to do. I don't have to really do any infrastructure at all. Does that load work for everyone? It's running, really. Okay. Should be fast. Oh, you know what? I am currently in an AWS account. I think they're primary. I'm probably in the same region. What, what cloud did you pick? Okay, what cloud were you in? <clears throat> Eight seconds? Really? Mine was 35 seconds. No, it'll tell you right next to the query ID, this part, it'll say... If we want to dive in, say, say you're having like a long one, click the query ID, it'll still run. Um, and then you click this little link and it'll show you what's going on. Some of the results will be here. Uh, and then the profile that I promised earlier, 
I can see a lot of my time was spent on an external scan. I got 61 million records in from that. Um, that went to a, an insert statement. And then the results um, are pretty small. Um, so in the worksheet, you see down here your, your result set. We have a query ID. You click that and it gives you a UUID that's actually a link to the specific history entry for this run. And then click profile. It'll, it'll take you to details first. It's kind of the context of what was run, how many rows, the high level stuff, and the profile. Um, I've had some really like crazy ones that make giant trees with different joins and different views. And um, a really interesting thing here is something might be a view that you don't realize is a view when you run it. Um, and when you see something messy here, you oh, okay, I need to turn that into a table, not a view. And that's a really easy way to get better performance. And on the right, we can see how much time was spent on processing and how much was on disk. And those are two things that tell you, should I focus on a bigger warehouse and a better query, or should I focus on changing the way I'm storing the data? Um, if you have really high processing time, that's the bottleneck, it might be better to increase the size of your warehouse or come up with a better way of writing it. Like if you're using a UDF when really you could use like a built-in optimized function, maybe get rid of the UDF. Does this make sense? If yours is still running, you might not see all this. It's done. Two and a half minutes, that's interesting. Can you go to your, uh, can you go to the query profile? Can I look at that? Can I take, can I look? Okay, I wish we had time, but we don't have time to explore that. I wish we could. Um, so back to worksheet. Let's go back to the worksheet here. I don't wanna talk too loud. And we should be able to, okay, so here in the default, um, before we even look at the table, if you go over, uh, highlight at, on it, and click, you, you wanna refresh, because again, we don't trust this. You'll see how many rows and how much data. It's 1.6 gigs. That's compressed on disk, so it's actually a lot more. And Snowflake has great compression. Um, if I wanna preview the data, it's probably logical to just, like in any other DB system, select star, limit 100, 10, whatever. So right click, do preview data. It'll use your current warehouse and it'll just grab the top stuff. Uh, you know I'm a fan of using SQL over UI. That's one thing I use a ton, because it's just one click. Um, so I can look around, data looks pretty good. Like this is what I would expect, right? The start station, stop station, um, ooh, location data, that's the best. I love map charts, those are so fun. So um, we got quite a lot here. Looks to be at, at a glance fine. So let's truncate the table. Line 79, what we're gonna do is get rid of it, which for the people who it took a little extra time might sound not great, but let's do it. And we're gonna demonstrate some of what I'm saying about um, parallelizing this workload. So this warehouse, we don't have to turn it off, we don't have to delete it, we don't have to recreate it, we're just gonna alter it because warehouses get changed. They are, they, they are fluid, they move over time. And that's why you never wanna call one the large warehouse or the small warehouse, because I've had the extra small warehouse be 4XL before. And you don't realize it if you don't know what you're doing. So we're gonna alter it and we're gonna set it to large. So it was small, which is two nodes. Large is gonna be bumped to medium for four, large is eight. So we're gonna have four times the compute. Ideally, if this is perfectly linear, we should see this happen in one eighth of the time. We're not gonna have to do the math, but let's check it out. <laughs> so same command, this is identical, right? Copy into, So some amount of time is gonna be a little higher because there's more nodes to provision. Usually at this level, like large and below, you don't see big differences, even extra large and below. But like 4XL, I've done that before, and it, it could take five minutes or so to provision. So 
If it's still on, yeah, because you, you, you lose out that initial like activation energy of turning it on. So if I look, um, mine, mine ran probably not all that much faster, but mine ran fast in the beginning. Eleven seconds from two minutes. See, that makes me think it wasn't um, purely bound by any sort of I/O or location. I, if I had to guess, your warehouse was off and mine wasn't, it, and you had an anomalously large queue time waiting for it to turn on. Um, I had a not a debate, but we were talking internally. Like, I said, it it's instant to get a warehouse, and someone's like, no, it takes it can take time. I'm like, yeah, it, it takes time, but it's essentially instant. No, it, it takes a long time. Okay, let's go look. And I have the history of our entire warehouse for a year, and I can tell you how long it took each warehouse to provision. And I said, okay, well, what's the cutoff? 30 seconds, 20 seconds, a minute. Let's call it a minute. How many times did it take more than a minute? And it was like 0.005% of the time that has ever happened, never built beyond five minutes. Um, so that's the nice thing about Snowflake. All the metrics are there. You don't have to take anyone's word. We can just go find out and chart it, maybe blog about it. Okay, cool. So th this demonstrates that, you know, bigger warehouses typically make things run faster. Now, let's create a new warehouse. Um, this whole section is talking about how you think about warehouses differently than maybe you would have thought. Um, the naming is super confusing because this whole thing is a Snowflake data warehouse, or technically it's the data platform now. They just announced that, whatever. Um, so let's create our analytics warehouse because our compute warehouse, or you might consider it a loading warehouse, that's going to be busy doing load stuff and it's going to have its own usage profile that may not need to turn on instantly. Latency is not so important for load. Throughput's really important. So have one that turns on slower but is bigger. Perfect. Your BI though, latency is really important. If someone has it lag a little bit when you load it, they might just leave or they think it's trash. They don't care how, uh, how much love and attention you put into it, right? They're, they're demanding. So let's create our warehouse um, as a large for analytics. And move into module five. Any questions so far? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a good question. The question was, why did I do a 60 second auto suspend on this analytics warehouse when it seems, uh, with latency being so important, that we might want that to be longer. So it stays on, stays active. As soon as someone wants something, it turns on. Uh, the reason is I care about you, Andy. I care about you a lot. Uh, I care about all of you. And I don't want to burn through your credits. We're pretending here, um, but you're not actually going to have any users today on the analytics warehouse. So uh, no need to burn through credits. You don't have to. That's all. In production, like with a lot of this, you would do it differently. Um, but a 60 second, that's a good start time. And check it out, maybe it's good enough. Tableau has a lot of caching, Sigma has a lot of caching um, that may cover you in the latency department. Sigma especially, they just announced a thing. There's a web-based UI um, dashboard development utility I have. Uh, they will, as long as the data isn't older than 24 hours, they will, right when you load, immediately just show you the last result while it refreshes in the background. And that can take 20 seconds, fine, then it'll update. Um, and it's just a better experience for your end users. And I can even, I can even show that real quick. Um, hash map snowflake usage. So that pops up, and then individually those little blue arrows, which are hard to see probably up there, they're refreshing. And so I can see my rolling 30 days of usage, I can see um, tasks, which are automatic scheduled flows within Snowflake, um, that Snowflake doesn't expose great metadata about. So if you're trying to identify which task is driving your costs, um, this is really easy. And that orange thing is a thing I did middle of the month, that's that spike we saw in the warehouses. Uh, I can see usage uh, by warehouse, which used to be really readable, but now we have so many warehouses, I need to re redo this. Um, and then also by user as well. The system's the number one, that's gonna be your scheduled tasks, but my five train service uses quite a lot as well. And I am right here. Not that bad, I'm pretty efficient, even with all these uh, demos. So this is really cool. This would be really difficult to get on something like Redshift or uh, Azure Data Warehouse, um, or Synapse, I guess they're calling it now. Be tricky. Okay, 
let's go on, let's go to line 105. So as always, we get in habit, we are going to set our context. We want to be the sysadmin, uh, we want to use this analytics warehouse, uh, and we're still in city bike public, looking at this very cool bike data. And just like we did with the preview before, uh, which under the hood is just a select star limit 100, we can write the query here in limit 20. And we see a little breakdown. I can open history here, and I can see the last couple queries I had and uh, different metadata about them, uh, and jump to their query IDs as well. So that's nice instead of having to go to history each time. Actually, I didn't know about this for a long time, even though it looks obvious. And I was just, I kept the history tab open on its own space. And then up here, the execution kind of profile. Um, queuing, that is how much time was spent waiting to be able to execute. So probably waiting on the warehouse to turn on because it was cold. Um, compilation is actually taking the SQL I have and converting it into an executable plan to actually run in machine language. And then execution is what time was actually spent running. So yeah, compilation looks kind of high here, one and a half seconds. This is just a select star, weird. And then we can see the results. Um, you can download this as a CSV, I've done that before, uh, especially early days when I just wanted to get a chart. I run a query that normally would be pretty complex to do outside of Snowflake, but I don't have direct connection to Excel or Power BI, but I know how to load a flat file. So I'll download it here, upload it, look if it's a worthwhile chart, and if it is, then I'll do a live connection. Um, so you get a lot, of, a, a lot of ability here. Or you can send this to a colleague who's not on Snowflake yet. Now let's, let's run some SQL, let's, let's do something of value. Um, we are gonna run a rather complex transformation here where we're grabbing just at the hour level for each start time because we're gonna aggregate at the hour level um, uh, to date, we're just gonna call that date. Um, count star is the number of trips, so within each bucket, how many trips do we have, you aggregate at that level. Um, the average trip duration divided by 60, so Trip durations in minutes. So divide by 60, you get, uh, sorry, it's in seconds. Divide by 60, you get minutes. The average is just average in minutes is um, useful. And then we have Haversine, which is a really complex built in function that's going to get us, you know what Haversine is? Really? You guys wrote them from scratch. I have no idea what Haversine is other than it, I think, is getting us the distance based on average distance. It accounts for the curvature of the Earth. And it's as the bird flies, right? It's not gonna, okay. So straight line. Presumably you're not just plowing through buildings on your bike, right? Uh, but this is a good approximation, right? For just this kind of thing. And it, it, you can conceive that this is the kind of metric you might want to know about if you're a company that does this, and you want to plan how many bikes go in an area, and how often are you going to have to plan to go pick a bike up manually? Right? You guys have seen the, the scooters here. It's a really similar data set. Uh, we're going to group by the date and order by the date. Let's run that. Now remember, we're working over 60 plus million records, and this is going to compute for all of it, and then it filters what comes back to you. Um, and this, this is what we get. It's very fast. Um, we're using, I believe, a large, so that makes sense, it should be fast. So in two seconds, we get the date, which is really down to the hour. That should probably, probably be called like date hour or something. Um, the number of trips and uh, the average duration and the average distance. If I were a BI person like Kyle here, I would be itching to get this in a chart because I want to see, uh, are there certain days of the week, right, that are anomalous, certain hours? I imagine daytime is more important. Um, trip durations, can I look at the top five percentile of longest trips and see what, what are they doing? Like why, where does this start, where does it end? And I might put a map together to identify user behavior. Did that run for everyone? Yeah. Now something really interesting, uh, another one of my favorite parts of Snowflake on line 134, let's run the same query, same thing. Um, at this point, our warehouses might even be off. They might be off. Um, and if you look before, it took, it took about two seconds, which is really fast. 
And if you run again, uh, I got it in 141 milliseconds. Very fast. Um, and my warehouse is off. So Snowflake has a killer feature for BI and for a lot of things that if you run a word for word query, identical. I mean, it has to match um, on data that has not changed and they have uh, hashing functions to be able to check um, what data was used to compute versus what exists now without actually having to compare the data. You will get back the result from the cache, which is lightning fast and it won't charge you any money. Um, this is the result set cache. It uh, expires after 24 hours if it's not used, but if you keep using it and the data doesn't change, um, you can have the cache go for 30 days, at which case you'll have to recompute it once and then you get another 30 days. Um, it's one of the coolest features of Snowflake and cache hacking is uh, a lot of what I do to try to optimize both performance and cost for people. Um, to the point that I think Snowflake is actually starting to try to find ways to charge for this because some big shops have found ways to like really hack this and get tons of free compute from Snowflake. Um, there certainly is some limit to this cache size, but I've cached 10, 30 million records um, just fine. So functionally, I don't know that that's something to worry about. Uh, but it's a, great, it's a great resource. I can run it again, and it works across different people. So um, if I'm on the same instance as you guys, and I ran this first, when you guys run it, it'll be just like that. It doesn't matter that it was me. It doesn't matter what warehouse it was. And you don't even turn a warehouse on. Um, if I go into the query ID, this has a really interesting profile. It's just query result reuse right away. That way, if you have a really fast query, you can determine whether it was here or not. If I go back to my history and look at what I had for the, the first time I ran it, two seconds right here, it's first gonna scan the table. It's gonna take all records from that table and aggregate them, the output of which is 44.3, and then it's gonna sort because we had it sort by the date descending. Uh, and then this last part, I don't know exactly what this last part does. It's just, it's just for getting the results to your screen, uh, for displaying the results. Uh, so it sends all of those over there. Um, overall, I can see that IO and processing were about equal, right? So if I wanted to optimize this, uh, I would probably start at storing the data differently. Maybe pre-aggregate a lot of this and then do the haver scene, I don't know, ahead of time and then calculate the average that way. So um, that might help. That'll, that'll reduce processing and reduce IO as well. Or maybe I'll do a limit, right? I only want it for the last two weeks. That'll, that'll chunk process, that'll chuck IO right down, really small. Okay. Does that make sense how we might run a query and leverage the cache? And, okay. Fantastic. Now let's run a query that I think is really interesting. I want to see the day of the week um, that is most popular for trips. So I can run that. And I can see, uh, so this is sorted by um, number of trips from most to least, which is confusing because like Thursday, it looks like the numbers may be bigger, but it's not. It's just not fixed width. Uh, Wednesdays are the most popular, which I didn't expect. I thought Saturdays for sure, right? Just people going out, but I guess this is like a commuting thing, and I don't know, maybe Mondays you feel too tired to bike. You want to take a car or something? I don't know. And then um, we can clone. So this is production data. Say we want to do some destructive stuff. We want to change some values. We want to see if it'll actually work. Normally, if you want to hit production data, you either A, are reckless and you just do it, or B, you make a copy of it. And that can take time, especially for a large load. So maybe you just take a subset of it, copy to a play space, and you play there. Um, Snowflake has this concept of a clone, which is just a pointer in time to your table named as something else that you treat like a table. So I will create my trips dev as a clone and that is near instant. And that's because we're not copying any data. All the changes made to this table are being added incrementally on top of the underlying data storage. So if I point to the point in time right now um, and then start modifying, I just branch it kind of like in Git. I'm just doing a branch of this table and I can do anything I want here. I can destroy it. I can do anything and I won't impact production storage. This allows you to experiment very quickly. And in this environment, 
agility and iteration speed is really, really critical uh, because you don't always know exactly what you're looking for. So if you can reduce the time of innovation, you can innovate more within the same amount of time. Obviously, that's a win. Um, that's the basics for clone. Uh, clone is just kind of a really cool uh, consequence of the time travel ability. So most tables, by default, I think it's one day. Anything you do to them, you can query at a specific timestamp in the past to see, like overnight, you did a load and things look odd. You want to see specifically how many records did I add overnight, but you don't add a timestamp column to your table. Um, that might be tricky to do. Uh, or you can just query, especially with merges and stuff that oh, updates, you can query it at yesterday at this time and then right now and compare the two as if they were different tables. Uh, and that time travel goes back to 90 days. Ooh, good question. I think so. No. No, I don't think so. Okay, so the question was, um, does the clone inherit the same security as the table? I think by default, no. But there's a flag to have it... Um, grant the same permissions. And if you want to know that, um, let's look at the clone documentation. So it's writable and independent of its source. Um, you must have at least read access to an object to be able to clone it. Oh, it doesn't add to your storage charges either because that data is already stored, right? It didn't copy it, but you're also not getting stored for additional uh, charges. And then, yes, so the copy grants keyword will allow you to copy those grants. Otherwise, it is its own new thing that you have to grant access to. Okay, good question. I mean, that's typically how you just resolve stuff with Snowflake because it's kind of hard to just know. Cool. Okay, so we, we've got to the clone. Um, I think we can make it through module six, uh, which is some weather, and then we might have to talk about breaking because uh, we're at time. Okay, let's create a new database called weather, which is fun. Um, we are going to inject some weather data because one logical thing to think about with your bike rides is maybe the weather impacts them. Uh, then we set our context. Now that we have this new weather, we're going back to our compute warehouse and we are using the pre-built public schema within weather. And let's create a table. So instead of having lots of columns, we're going to have something called a variant. Uh, and this is JSON weather data. This is semi-structured. Um, not a lot of databases can do this, uh, and the ones that do, um, the syntax isn't quite so clean. You gotta really fight with it. Uh, but variant is the name of the column for uh, a semi-structured type. I can put anything I want in there. And then we create a new stage. Again, another S3 stage is New York City weather. So, um, oh, about the, the city bike, I think that's New York City bikes, specifically. Yeah, I, I didn't mention it, I didn't think about it. I guess I didn't know it. <clears throat> so cool, we create a stage. This should all feel very comfortable again. Create this stage, let's see if it works. Cool, there's data there. And then let's copy the data in. So our file format, this is what it would look like if we didn't have a named file format. The JSON default works fine for this. It's already pre-made, pre-built. Let's just use it. There's no reason to rename it um, unless you expect the data could change in the future. And then you would want to have a named resource in case that JSON file format's used by like four or five different loads. Instead of having four or five different places to update, you just have the one and they all reference it. So we do a copy into. Okay, that was pretty, pretty fast. Um, looks like we had 61 files. And if I refresh here and go to my weather, database at the bottom, public, we see JSON weather. This has only 57,000 and 1.3 megs. So this is about 1,000th of the footprint of our, our previous uh, load. And let's select star, because you might be wondering, what is this gonna look like? Because we just uploaded JSON data into a single column. So we just have the column called V, which is value. You could use whatever name you wanted here. 
And these are the results. You can click on it, so make it like kind of human readable. And we have a city field, so we can have specific latitude and longitudes for this weather, um, a specific name of New York, um, lots and lots of like regional naming for different ways to spell New York. Um, and then we have main weather data. We have humidity, temperatures, um, a description of the weather, sky is clear, that's kind of useful. Um, and some wind. So uh, different reporting uh, sources for weather might report this in different ways. They might have different formats for temperature. It might be nested two levels down instead of one. This allows us to invest it all here, and then we can do transformations from this within the warehouse. This is the ELT paradigm instead of ETL uh, for the nerds who, <laughs> who know that. Uh, if you don't know, don't don't let it bother you. I try to avoid those terminologies because they're they're losing value by the day. Uh, but really it just means instead of extracting the data, transforming it somewhere, and then loading it into your final destination, um, you're gonna extract it, load it as it is, put it in there, and then all your transformation logic lives at the end in the warehouse, because uh, you're gonna end up doing transformations there anyway to get to your, your analytics consumable format. It's nice to have that all in one spot. And there are like a, a lot of other reasons why you wanna do it. Can you guys all see the weather data? Yeah, cool. Um, let's play with it. Let's create a view. So this view um, is going to be a collection of SQL that when we hit the view behind the scenes, it'll actually run this as well. Um, but we don't actually want to create a whole table at this time because we're just playing around. So the view is going to access these fields. So V is that column. The way you access um, semi-structured uh, fields is by using this colon syntax with uh, quotes, double quotes. So we're looking for time, we're casting it as a timestamp, and we're calling that the observation time. City ID, uh, which for New York should probably be all the same. And we're getting those really deeply nested weather entries into something that like a BI table or a BI tool could use. Because if you feed that to um, Tableau, you're not getting anything. You might be able to get a word cloud. Um, and then we're gonna we're gonna filter for where the the city ID is equal to what we know to be New York, and um, we're getting it from this table we just made. And let's grab information from the view. The view is instant; it doesn't incur any storage costs because you're just storing that query as if it were a table. Um, there are performance implications. If that was really complex, every time you hit it, it's going to be slow. But it's a really fast way to build something before you know it's worth actually investing pipeline resources into. And we're going to grab specifically um, January of 2018. And this data looks a lot more familiar to us in, in a database format now. We can see the specific times, um, the city ID, which should all be the same, New York, of course, country, all that should be the same. And we get data about weather, temperature, um, specifically this weather column, the clouds, snow, clear. Um, I think temperature probably has an effect on bike usage, but I think more is like the precipitation. And not just the chance of precipitation, the actual observation, is it raining right now? I'm willing to bet it stops being so bike friendly. Now that took uh, 3.78 seconds. If I ran it again, it interestingly took the same amount of time. And then, okay, so. Um, now, now you have the cache, because they didn't change, it's a word for word query. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. Maybe it didn't actually run that last time. No. Good. Yeah. So you can still benefit through views uh, with this cache. That's why views are, can still be quite nice. Um, now let's combine this with the, the bike data, right? So we're going to, let's start with the join. We're going to join our trips with our new view, where um, the hour as observation time um, is equal to the hour of the start time. So let's get those same hourly buckets. Um, and we're not, we're going to skip down here. We're, okay, back to the top. Uh, we're grabbing the weather as conditions. So that's that um, that description, right, of, of like clear or cloudy or anything like that. It's pretty standardized. And then we're grabbing the number of trips. So we're really grouping by this collection over time. 
And we don't want any time where the condition is null because this is semi-structured data, it may not exist. So we have to account for that. Uh, we're grouping by the type of weather and we're ordering by the number of trips descending. So we're gonna see what kind of weather makes for the best number of trips. And unsurprisingly, clear weather is the winner. Um, all the way at the bottom, smoke weather. <laughs> so now we've introduced some amount of bias. Is it true that smoky weather really affects people's ability to bike they don't want to? Or is it that that's a rare kind of weather? And it's just rare that people would be biking at that time or anything would be happening at that time. So you might want to balance this like over instances. So what's your bike rate, right? Or I don't know. Uh, something else where rain snow that kind of stuff that makes sense though fog maybe that only happens rarely in new york or only in the mornings like early early mornings anyway um this isn't a perfect representation right of oh for sure like thunderstorms people don't want to bike though that's probably true um, the smoke one's my favorite i didn't <laughs> i didn't expect to have that as weather um, cool that is module six. Um, we've been able to ingest data from two different sources. You've seen structured and semi-structured, multiple warehouse schemes. You've run queries. You've leveraged the cache. You've debugged weird long load times um, that didn't make any sense. By using pre-built uh, metrics, we didn't have to connect any other tool to make use of this. Um, there's more stuff down here, particularly around the shares, which are that's a more advanced feature. It's worth looking at. Um, and at the very bottom, I'll point your attention to um, my cleanup script, which is not normally in there, just to get it all back to how it is. I have to use this because I'm gonna run this again and again, um, but it's also maybe good for you if you just wanna get rid of this and try it from scratch. So we're a little over. Are there any questions so far? Yeah? Okay, thank you. Um, go on your own time. I know I personally, in an environment like this, it's fun socially, but I don't, absorb all that much. Um, go back and that, that bit.ly link, it's been working since September of last year, so you can continue using that. Um, these slides will make available, and then this is all recorded too, so um, we'll, we'll, we'll publish that. Cool. All right, well thanks guys, you've been great. Um, thanks for coming out.